Amen. Amen. Hey, it's good to be with you today. How many of you are still waking up after losing an hour last night? Some of you, because your, uh, your iPhone or your smartphone does it for you automatically, were like, wait, that was last night? I had no idea. Um, so here's what we're going to do, because we're all still kind of shaking off the cobwebs. Uh, we're, we're not a big elbow your neighbor church, but we're going to elbow our neighbor and make sure they're awake. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Elbow the person to the left or to the right of you. Um, yeah, yeah. I see some people going for the head. You can do that too. Um, if you want to utilize this moment uh, as an opportunity to get some aggression out, all the things you've wanted to do to your neighbor this week uh, with pastoral blessing and, and credence, uh, feel free. It's, uh, it's good to be with you. If you haven't met before, my name is Jake, privileged of pastoring here at the church. Uh, I think for some, it's spring break this week as well, so maybe you have plans with that if you have kids. Uh, others of you are just going to use it because your students are going to use it to sleep until noon every day. We bless you for that season of your life. Anybody remember back to that? Me either. I don't remember that. Uh, it's been a while. But uh, it, is a, it is a fun time, and yet it's also been, I think, a deeply meaningful and impactful time as we've been journeying through Psalm 23 together on our way to Easter. This Lenten period has provided us a look at Psalm 23 and who God is in the midst of our storms and our valleys. We recognize that it'd be really easy whenever we have problems in our life to focus in on the problem, but focusing on the problem alone is not the thing that's going to get us to where we want to go. We want to know who God is, the one who leads us, the one who guides us, the one who directs us, if we want to overcome all of life's challenges that we face. And so we've given you a companion guide, like a daily devotional. If you haven't leaned into that, you still can. You can go online and get it digitally, go out to the lobby and get it in paper form. We'd love for you to take advantage of it, and I found personally that journeying through that every single day on top of the, the collection of talks we've given on the weekend have really brought to life something that I thought I knew pretty well. Psalm 23, as a pastor, you get to share that at a lot of funerals and memorial services and key moments in people's lives, but there's something different about taking it line by line, and that's what we've sought to do. Now, it's, it's been said that the seven deepest canyons on the planet have all been formed the same way. That, that streams or rivers have moved through the Earth's surface and year after year, decade after decade, century after century, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground until this canyon is formed. And so it's really cool because we find that some of the most fertile soil on the planet is in the bottom of these canyons. Now think about where some of these canyons are. You think about the Grand Canyon and how desolate it is all around. But here we have this life source. And so there are indigenous tribes and other groups that have found that if you want to survive in the desert, you've got to do it in a canyon and in the bottom of the canyon. The Havasupai people are one representation of a group of people that have found this is, this is where I can grow my crops. This is where I can raise my livestock. This is where I can find water as a, as a life source. And their entire society is functioned in the bottom of a canyon. And I think that's a beautiful illustration for how life works. That in some of our darkest moments, this is where we find some of our most meaningful lessons. We find life and vitality in the midst of the valley. And so I don't just want valleys to be seen as a negative thing, although they are often negative things, but I want us to also understand the richness and the wealth that comes from walking through the valley as well. You know people who have been to the darkest places in the world, don't you? Like those dark, cavernous moments uh, throughout my years on this earth, I've had a number of opportunities to interview and talk to people who have fought in wars. Wartime stories from World War II, Vietnam, Korean War, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, going to Iraq, Afghanistan, all the different places. And, and some of those stories have brought people to really dark places. I interviewed my grandfather when I was young. He fought in World War II. And, and, and as you hear some of these wartime stories, it causes people sometimes to grab hard on the chair that they're sitting in, to shut their eyes as though they're going back in time to that really dark and confusing place. Sometimes it, their voice changes. They, they get really intense or they almost can't speak because of the PTSD that's coming out from remembering what it was like to walk through dark valleys. 
Today, we're going to look at Psalm 23, 4 specifically. And we've been journeying through Psalm 23, line by line, statement by statement. And today is perhaps the statement that we think of most when we think of Psalm 23, walking through the darkest valley. We're going to talk about what happens when you're in a dark valley. Who are you in the dark valley? Where is God in the dark valley? How do you get out of the dark valley? So if you're in one of those dark valleys today, listen in. If you aren't in one of those dark valleys, listen in because you will be at some point in your life. We all walk through the darkest valley. And if you know somebody in your life who's walking through a dark valley, you can go to our YouTube page and have them tune in. And so I want to say hello to everyone who's found us on the YouTube page in the future sometime. We're so glad that you're here. We want you to lean in, to tune in, because as we walk through this together, I think what we're going to find is not only are valleys not always negative, but valleys are part of life. Here's what I'd like us to do. We, we've been walking through a daily devotional, listening to Psalm 23, but also each week we've been engaging with Psalm 23 by speaking it out. We want to digest this text. We, it talks to us about who God is, his character and his nature, and we want this to be so rich on the inside of us by the time we're done that when we walk through the next valley in our lives, we're going to walk through with a confidence and with a memory of all that we walked through here today. So I hope you're ready because we're going to walk through Psalm 23 by reciting it together. Everybody ready? We do this every week. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, in week one, we talked about the Lord being our shepherd. We said that God protects, provides, and cares for your soul. That's what shepherds do. And that when God protects, provides, and cares for your soul, David declares, you lack nothing. Now, again, we talked about how countercultural that is in our culture today. The idea that you lack nothing is probably not true of your life if you're like everybody else I know. Because we all talk about the things that we lack. I wish I was smarter. I wish I was prettier. I wish I was, uh, had more money. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. We, we talk about all the things. Even this week, my wife looks at me and says, we need this thing on Amazon. And I was like, I feel like that's every week. We need this thing on Amazon. But when the Lord is your shepherd, you lack nothing. Think about how crazy that is to think about. Could you imagine your life lacking nothing? And yet when God protects you, provides for you, and cares for you, you lack nothing. This is the statement of David. In the second week, we talked about how then God, because we lack nothing, this is what he does. He nourishes our soul. He makes us lie down in green pastures and provides everything that we need. He leads us beside still waters. And then he does this soul refreshment thing, which basically means he leads us back. So when we wander, when we stray, when we do all these things, he leads us back to what matters. It's like he provides us with a true north, bringing us back to where we need to go. And then he leads us. And last week we talked about how he leads us. He leads us into righteousness, right relationship with him, right relationship with others, and into places of justice. And, and what we learned last week is that when God leads us in this direction, he puts his stamp of approval on it. He says, for my name's sake, which is another way of saying, I'm going to back this. I'm going to endorse this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this is, this is worth following. He's putting his reputation on the line that he is a good shepherd, not just a shepherd, but a good shepherd who's going to lead you in the right direction. But here's, here's what commentators have noticed, right? There's something distinctly different between those three verses 
in this verse. Let's read it together one more time. Psalm 23, 4 says, even though I walk through the, val the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is probably why we refer to this psalm in our modern context as the funeral psalm. And we talk about walking through the darkest valley. The original Hebrew language talks about the valley of the shadow, deep darkness, or even deep gloom. And commentators have noticed that there's a big difference between this text and the first three verses for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a big difference between the first three verses because of the shepherd who's leading and guiding, that, that everything seems to be going well. But in verse four, we see that man seems to be walking alone. So it's a shift in perspective. The first three, everything's great. God is leading. He seems really close to his sheep. But in verse four, it seems like you're walking alone. I mean, you know God is with you, but you're walking alone. And those of you who are walking through a valley, you know what I'm talking about. The second thing is, it's not just a shift in perspective, right? But, but it's a shift. It's a shift in, in David's understanding of his environment. You see, in the first three verses, we're in green pastures. We're in still waters. Everything is going well. But in verse four, we're in this dark, dreary valley where it seems like nothing is going right. Now, I wonder what David is thinking of here. Most, most commentaries and, and theologians would say that David, when he's thinking about this, is thinking about an area in the Middle East called the Wadi Kelt. Wadi means ravine, and the Wadi Kelt, a, a lot of things in the Bible happen in the Wadi Kelt. Like, this is the word of the day. Everybody say Wadi Kelt. Just making sure you're awake, right, on Sunday morning, on, on Time Change Sunday. The Wadi Kelt, Wadi meaning ravine, and this Wadi Kelt is, is an 18 to 20 mile stretch that moves from Jerusalem all the way to Jericho. A lot of things happen here. For instance, we think that this is the scene of the Good Samaritan. Maybe you remember the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, this guy is walking on a very dangerous road from one city to another, and the robbers come because it's a dangerous environment, and they ambush him, and they take everything that he has. And then we have this beautiful story of how somebody who's seen as an enemy comes in and, and brings everything back to life. It's a beautiful story that Jesus tells. But in the Wadi Kelt, we also believe that this is where Elijah is in the cave, if you remember the story in 1 Kings 17, he's standing up to Ahab and Jezebel and the 450 prophets of Baal. He calls down fire from heaven. When he calls down fire from heaven, something incredible happens. A, a miracle takes place and all of the fears should be quenched. But instead, this king and his queen say, Elijah, we're going to have you killed. And instead, Elijah escapes. Even though he's just called fire down from heaven, he immediately cowers in fear and goes into a cave wondering if God is real. And he's praying, and, and God comes in the wind, and, and he is not in the wind, and, and this happens, and that happens, in the earthquake, and then in the still, small voice, God speaks to his heart in the Wadi Kelt. Again, a cavernous, fearful environment. Not only does this happen, but David, in his own life, he's the writer of Psalm 23, we believe that this is where he confronts Absalom. And the conflict takes place. Absalom is his son who wants to take over his kingdom. We believe that the conflict takes place in the Wadi Kelt. On top of that, we also think that this is where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in Bethany on the road to the Wadi Kelt. So all this is happening. David is aware of all this, this deep ravine. And David sets the stage for what it's like for us to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This morning, I, I want to take a little bit of time to help you and everyone who may be watching today to figure out what we should think and how we should respond when we're walking through these darkest valleys. The first thing I want you to remember is that you cannot avoid the valley. You can minimize it. You can maximize it. You can say it's not there or you can say your life is over. And a lot of people do either one of those things. But you cannot avoid the valley. I had this friend who I was talking to several months ago, and he was talking to me about all the great things that were going to go on in his life. Um, I love Optimus, and, and I love spending time with Optimus, but he was telling me about the vacation he was going to go on, his wife was going to get promoted, his son was going to get onto this club sports team. He, he felt so good about his life. And then recently I saw him at a conference, and I said, hey, man, like, I, I've never met a more positive person. Like, tell me about your wife's job. Tell me about the vacation you want to. He goes, oh, I did none of that. 
And they go, why? He goes, well, about two weeks after I saw you, this roof needed to be replaced. And uh, I, I mean, that cost us like 15 grand. And then uh, my son didn't make the team. My wife got the new job, but she didn't like her boss. And so she's moved on to something else. Uh, it was of all people, John Lennon, who said it this way. He said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. We can all relate to that, can't we? That we have all these great ideas about what our life is going to look like. And then life happens. And our life doesn't turn out the way that we planned for it to go. Some of you are planners in the room. And this just bothers you more than anything else. We make plans. We think we know what's going to happen. Here's what Kenneth Bailey says about how we're to look at the valley. You can't avoid the valley. He says the valley of death Deep darkness is a section of the trail that cannot be avoided. There is no bypass road and no magical escape. The only way forward is through the valley of sin and death. He goes on to say that shepherds understand that on one side of the ravine is a green pasture. And once the sheep have eaten everything that's green, they've got to move them to the other green pasture on the other side of the ravine. And the only way there is to take them down the side of the mountain to the valley floor into the dark shadowy valley and back up to the other side. You can't avoid it if you want to keep sustaining everything that you need. So here's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember when you walk through a valley because no one can ignore and no one can avoid the valleys in life. Everybody's going to go through them. Your valley may not mean personal sin. So many times we connect going through a valley with the fact that we messed up. There are times where you go through a valley because you messed up. Can I get an amen? We, we walk through valleys because of our own stupidity sometimes. That happens. But like most things in life, is your valley because of your personal sin? Sometimes. Sometimes. Your roof is 30 years old and it needs to be repaired. You didn't sin against God and now you have a $15,000 bill. It's just part of life. We all go through valleys. Everybody. Jesus went through a valley. It was called the road to the cross. He didn't sin. He wasn't without error. He had people who tried to kill him for half his ministry. He's going through valley after valley. The apostle Paul is shipwrecked. He's beaten. He's whipped. He's flogged. He's going through valleys. Did he once look at God and go, God, I must have sinned against you to be whipped so hard? No. We all go through valleys. So sometimes your valley is because of your sin. And sometimes your valley is your valley because it's your valley. And you walk through to the other side. As we read last week from James chapter 1, sometimes God puts these tests and trials into our life to build a perseverance in our faith. And so you can't avoid the valley. And not only can you not avoid the valley, but you got to understand that your valley doesn't mean you're any less blessed than you currently are. Valleys don't change your blessing. One of the worst things that happened in like the last 10 years was this whole hashtag thing on social media called hashtag blessed. Because now it's like hashtag blessed, I've went, I, I went to Bora Bora. Hashtag blessed, I met a celebrity. Hashtag blessed, I have a bigger home. Hashtag blessed, I got promoted. Meanwhile, like, like people are going, well, you're blessed because you have all these kids, but I can't meet a spouse. I'm, I'm dealing with infertility. I didn't get promoted. Does that mean I'm not blessed? We have this material idea of what blessing looks like. Like if I'm not winning at life, then I'm not blessed. And we talked last week and we said, you know that the board game, the game of life, we said, that's not how life works. You're not trying to speed through life to try and win a game. Life is not a game to be won. It's a relationship to be had with God. That goes deeper and deeper. You don't want to get to the end of your life and go, I won, I died, now all the toys go back in the box. You don't want to do that. So instead, what, what we want to do is we want to have a firm understanding that God cares for us, that God loves us, that God is with us in the midst of our darkest valleys. That God wants to walk with us and we're not less blessed. That true spiritual blessing starts with relationship that's available to all of us. You can walk into a relationship with God simply by surrendering your life. And then, and only then, can you truly claim the blessing that comes from being called a son or a daughter. 
Truly then can you only say at that moment in your life, I will never walk alone through the darkest valleys, that the blessing of God is available to me and, and that there are spiritual gifts that are given to me in response to that as well. That there are all these things that God provides to me uniquely for my story because he loves me, that he's called me and he's commissioned me and called me his own. Your blessing is not changed. Now the verse goes on to say, and in response to that, we are to then fear no evil. Because your blessing hasn't changed because you go through a valley, because valleys are normal. Valleys are normal. You need not fear. You need not fear. This is tough because fear is a physiological response. Like we fear when we feel the, the hairs on the back of our neck. And I do have them, right? We have hairs on the back of our neck that stand up. When somebody yells or we have a loud noise, it makes us kind of jump. Or we go down to the basement because basements are scary. I don't know why. They always have been. Don't turn the lights on. Just walk in your basement in, in the dark next time. Tell me you're not a little scared from childhood. Like there's, there's something physiological about fear. But what Jesus is trying to teach us and what David is trying to teach us, both through his ministry and through Psalm 23, is that we are not to be overwhelmed by fear, not to be driven by our feelings. Fear is natural, but fear doesn't have to be defining. There's a big difference between the two, and I think it's important that we understand how we're going to wrestle through, because while we should fear no evil, we find that do not fear is one of the most common things that God asks of his people. Like Abraham, do not fear. Moses, do not fear. David, do not fear. Elijah, do not fear. Ezekiel, do not fear. Daniel, do not fear. They're all given this command. Mary, when she finds out she's going to have Jesus, do not fear. The shepherds in the field, do not fear. Do not fear. Why is it that God keeps telling his people not to fear? Because we all fear. We all fear. Every one of us fears. We not only have this physiological response, but we also fear the things that are often in front of us. And make no mistake, right? Psalm 23 says, do not fear evil. Evil absolutely exists in the world. And you may, like me, have walked into a room or a situation or had a conversation with a person. And sometimes it looked a lot like a horror movie. And sometimes it looked really sweet and innocent on the outside. But you walked out of that situation and went, that is pure evil. That's pure evil. And you weren't joking. You weren't being, you know, pedantic about it. Like, that was pure evil. You know pure evil when you see it because it drives you to a place of hopelessness. It seeks to destroy you. It seeks to destroy your relationship with God. You know pure evil because it means your harm. And if you're walking through this life thinking that there isn't someone out to destroy you, you are fooled. You're fooled. There is always someone out there to destroy you. Just as much as there is a very loving God who's out there, there is something that is so evil that's out there to destroy you. And so you will walk through the darkest valley, but you fear no evil. Why? Because he is with you. Not because of how great you are, how smart you are. You can get all the degrees in the world. I got a couple of them. You can go and have all the experience in the world. I've had a few of them. But I promise you, you will get to the end of yourself really fast in the valley. And you'll start realizing all the things you don't know and all the places you haven't been to help you. And you'll, you'll realize your limitations. I'm just not good at that and I need that right now. You're gonna come to the end of yourself and you're gonna realize that there is something to fear unless you've leaned into the presence of God and trusted and relied on him to lead you through the darkest valley. Only then... Can you say, I will not fear? Romans 12 tells us this. If you want to overcome evil, do not be overcome by evil. But the way to do it is by finding good. And there is only one who is good. And his name is Jesus. God's presence allows us to overcome everything that we face in this life. Without God's presence, we're going to get swallowed up by evil in this world. I'm not saying that you might not end up with a nice little life on this earth, but the self-centered life is spent accruing things and the world misses the mark. Instead, 1 Peter 1, 4 says that when you're following God, you gain an inheritance that can never perish, 
never spoil or never fade. If you're currently fearing your darkest valley, I'm just asking you to turn your heart over to Jesus, to come to the end of yourself, be honest about it, and to say, I need God to lead me. David says, I will not fear evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. Your rod and your staff. God always uses his rod and his staff in the valley. Here's, here's what his rod is. His rod is like a two to three foot stick that's got like uh, maybe nails at the end or shards of glass at the end. And it's used as a sign of protection by the shepherd to defeat the wild animals. And so it's first used for protection. And this is how the shepherd beats off the animals. But then it's also used, and we see this in Leviticus 26, it's also used as, as a way to count the sheep when they come back into the pen. The sheep would, would dust underneath the rod as they walk into the pen. And so this is a sign of protection, right? This is, uh, the rod is a sign of protection. It's about warding off the enemies, but it's also about your preservation as you walk in, that God knows you by name, that God calls you his own, God draws you into his story. But then we're, we're taught that he also uses his staff and his staff is used in a little different way. You've got this crook on the end, but it's God's sign of guidance to you. God wants to guide you, not just protect you. And so that, that little crook on the end would be used to go around the neck of the sheep. Whenever the sheep strays, and uh, even psychology, modern psychology says we are all prone to make terrible decisions with our lives. Just know that. Like, it's science. You're, you're prone to make bad decisions with your life. So when we do that, God brings us back and draws us back into a story, draws us back into relationship with him as well. Just like in the first three verses where we're so close to the shepherd who's leading us and guiding us into green pastures and still waters. When we, when we wander in the valley of the shadow, when we're going on this dark path and we might be going in the wrong direction, he draws us back into his story. Now, kings and queens throughout the Middle Ages across Europe took note of this in several different cultures of how the shepherd leads and guides. And you'll notice they adopted the same thing in what they carried. The, the rod got replaced with a scepter. And we see as well the, the staff being used. And, and even in Egyptian tombs, we see the two, don't we, over the, over the front of many of these. It's this idea that those who are in leadership and authority not only protect their people, but they also guide their people and draw close to their people as well. That's what good rulership does, and that's what God does for us. And so I guess my question this morning is, if you're in the darkest valley, what do you fear? What do you fear? Look, we're, we're all going to go into different places this week. But I want us to remember that fear is just about focusing on the wrong thing. You have two options in your life. You can focus on your circumstances or you can focus on following the good shepherd. You've got two options this week. Some of you are going to walk into doctor's offices and you're going to hear a bad report. Some of you are going to walk back home and, and, and you're going to walk into some crazy circumstances. Some of you are going to walk into work this week and experience just a curveball you did not expect. We're all going to leave this place and a good percentage of us are going to have life happened, happen that we did not plan for. And some of us, the, the one thing that we face is going to so form a curveball in our lives that it's going to spiral us into a valley. <laughs> and we walked in going, I'm not in a valley right now. And next Sunday, we're gonna be like, I am in the darkest valley of my life. Because that's how life works. And when you do, you have the option to focus on your circumstances or to lean into relationship with the good shepherd. Look, I don't care if you're on the mountaintop or you're in the valley. Stop looking at the scenery. They call it rubbernecking on the road, right? When you see that car on the side, when you take in all the scenery and you forget where you're going, that's when you hit things. So you focus on where you're going. And, and, and what that does is it reminds you that when you're at your highest point, if you stare at that scenery, you're, you're prone to forget God. God, this is so good. I'm just going to leave you. 
You can't stay there. You're going to keep moving and progressing, but that's, that's where you're prone to move. And when you're in the darkest valley, God, where are you? Don't ever lose sight of the fact that God has not changed his relationship with you no matter where you are in the spectrum. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so instead, may you have a posture like Proverbs chapter 30. This king says, God, may you not give me so much that I forget you, and may you not give me so little that I despise you. But Lord, and this is my paraphrase, would you just give me what I need for today? <laughs> In other words, don't let me become so consumed by my circumstances. That's going to change. But lean into the one who will never change. The one who wants to lead and guide you. The one who wants to protect and provide for you. The one who wants to guide you when you're going in the wrong direction. So here's the call for us this morning. We have a couple of responses. The first one is this, right? And we don't do this every week, but, but I'm just aware that we've been talking about God leading you, being your shepherd, all this stuff. And that it's possible that some of us here this morning, like we don't know where we stand with God. Like we walked in here a month ago, just trying to figure this thing out. Or it's been the first time in a really long time that we've come to church. And we're just trying to wrestle through, or we've been coming for a long time, and we're just, I don't know, we're just digesting what's being said. But if I walked into a dark valley this week, I don't know that God is with me. I actually don't know where I stand with him. And the scriptures tell us that it has nothing to do with you being more or less favored than the person sitting to your left or right, but simply that somebody next to you may have just come to the end of themselves and surrendered and said, I'm ready to do it his way, not mine. I'm ready for him to lead me. I'm open to his forgiveness. I'm open to doing things in a different way. And so we want to give you the opportunity to pray a prayer of surrender. Say, God, I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to give it all to you. And then our second response is for everybody else, like everybody in the room. And it's the second prayer where we're going to pray, Heavenly Father, we give you everything. Like we surrender all to you. We take every burden, every hospital room. <laughs> we take every situation at work, every situation at home, everything that we fear this week. And we just give it to you. We give it to you. Lead us, guide us. And this week, I'm asking you, if you're going to give it to God, if you're going to release it, then stop worrying about your circumstances. Like, did I really give it to him? We overthink it sometimes. But instead, use this as the week that you're going to draw nearer to God in relationship than you ever have that you're going to be more fixated on who he is, his character, his love for you than you ever have. Draw into his presence. Use your car rides to reorient your life. Use your downtimes to, to just listen in reflection. Use this week as the week that your soul begins to cling to him instead of just hoping that you're going to get through the next situation. Because on the other side of that situation is another situation. The other side of that situation is, have you figured it out yet? It never ends. So stop the endless cycle of chasing after the next. If we could just get through this, if we could just get through that, stop it and just rest in the one who wants to lead and guide you this week. Draw near to his heart, draw near to him, and know that as you draw near to him, he always promises to draw near to you. Let's take some time to pray together. This morning with uh, just our eyes closed as a sign of focus and meditation, I want to invite those who need to come into a place of confession today to pray this prayer with me. I know it's hard to know what to pray when you're not quite sure. And so just like on my wedding day, making a vow, a commitment, somebody gave me words to say, I want to give you some words that you can say to try and help you on this journey. 
coming to a point of surrender, the end of yourself, a willingness to turn and receive the joy that comes from following Jesus. If you're in that space and you need to pray this prayer of confession, pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you just as I am. Please forgive me, Lord, for I've sinned. I surrender and I ask that you'd become the leader of my life. And I ask that you now lead me by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Look, as we take just another moment to pause in the quietness of this room, I wanna commit this week to praying for you if you prayed that prayer. I want you to know that you're not alone. And, and, and while we know that God is with you and that that prayer is a life-changing prayer, maybe even like the warming of God's presence begins to fill you, I want you to know that there's somebody in your corner this week for what you're going through. So if you prayed that prayer this morning, you'd like me to join you in prayer this week. I may not know your name, but I'll remember your face. I'll commit to praying for you each and every day this week. Did you just say that's me? Just, can you lift your hand? Let me know. I'd, li I'd like to pray for you this week. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else? Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, I got it. Anybody else? God, I just say thank you for those who have responded, those who have prayed and you've seen their hearts. Lord, we all know that dark valleys can be overwhelming when we fixate on them long enough. And so help us instead to fix our eyes on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. We truly cast our burdens on you knowing that you care for us. And so Father, our prayer is a prayer of release today for everyone in this room. We release the challenges and the weights. We, re we release the, the lack of trust and we just say, God, we know you can provide all that we need. We empty ourselves out. We empty up out our, our feeble attempts to try and control or manage the situations at hand. Lord, instead, would you fill us with your spirit in a fresh way? Give us life and vitality that only you can offer. We love you and we trust you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.